I knew this would happen. It happens every year now, and it's because of Josh Allen that it's going to happen every year for the next decade. All right, this is his fault. You remember that. The Will Levis stock is out of control. And I thought it was a little high even from the beginning of the year, but I thought, you know, hey, he can be a solid mid to late first round, maybe early second round pick, you know, as a developmental guy. But now you have ESPN analysts saying that he's the best quarterback in this class above Bryce Young, above CJ Stroud. And for me, that, that's when it's gone too far. And that's when we need to talk about it. Before I get into it, though, I, I always end up forgetting to say it. So real quick, if you like the content, hit the like button. If you want to see more content from me, maybe consider hitting that sub button. Um, it won't all be football. There's going to be some basketball stuff, some other just general sports stuff, maybe some other general stuff uh, in the future. But it is football season right now. So that's kind of what I'm in. Um, and yeah, if you have any comments about the video, let me know down in the comments. And uh, whether you agree or disagree with me, let me know. I, I try to respond to everybody I can. I just want to preface this video with the fact that this is just my opinion. And when it comes to football, compared to the guys who actually play the game, I'm an idiot when it comes to football, okay? So take it with a grain of salt. Understand that, okay? Um, the other thing, I, I wish I had started recording a while ago, just so I could have some evidence for this, but I have had a relatively good track record when it comes to picking quarterback outcomes. But I've had my misses and horrible takes like everybody else. Like, I, I never understood how Trubisky was ranked over Watson and Mahomes, but I did have Deshaun ranked over Pat Mahomes, which wasn't as bad of a take before he made his first massage appointment, so I don't I don't feel too bad about that. 2018, I was pretty confident Lamar could be a capable quarterback at the NFL level and was being severely underrated going into the draft, and also thought Josh Rosen was too much of a condescending dickhead to lead a group of men in the NFL. I'm absolutely the best quarterback in the draft, uh, by far. I want to win Super Bowls, and uh, I want to have the most, so uh, I'm coming for Tom Brady's record, and uh, I plan on getting picked pretty early. There were nine mistakes ahead of, made ahead of me, and I um, I will make sure over over the next decade or so that they, they will... Uh, they will know that they made a mistake. Although I did think Sam Darnold was going to be the best quarterback out of that class and thought Josh Allen was going to be an absolute bust. So yeah, not, not great on those two. Kind of missed on those two pretty big. And I nailed 2019. Kyler, number one, was pretty easy. But Daniel Jones, I had ranked as like a mid-second round talent, which I think has held up so far. 2020, not much to say. I, I had Tua slightly ranked over Herbert, which is where they ended up going. Um, Herbert's obviously been better, but Tua started coming to his own now, and all three quarterbacks at the top of that draft have been amazing. And uh, 2021, I didn't get fooled by the Zach Wilson hype, and uh, Trey Lance I'll give more time to, but it looks like he might have lost his job to Mr. Irrelevant after the injury. Um, I hope he comes back strong, but I wasn't a huge believer in Lance there either. And I was a staunch Justin Fields believer, and it looks like my faith has been rewarded. I still think the Broncos are going to really, really regret passing on him. All of that to say, I refuse to get tricked by another strong arm quarterback that gets the Allen or Mahomes comparison that looks nothing like them on tape unless you only watch their highlight reel. And look, I, I understand the comparisons to Allen that Levis gets when it comes to his size. Levis is 6'3", Allen is 6'4", both around 235, both have huge hands, large wingspans, and the same comb over and beard that are trying to hide their baby faces, but let's be honest, failing miserably. But game-wise, the only two similarities I see between the two are arm strength and toughness. The QB comp that I've come up with after watching his tape is going to scare some people, but I have to be honest... After what I've seen, I, I see more of Carson Wentz in Will Levis' game than Josh Allen. Now, I know that's not going to be popular with Kentucky fans or the fans of the team that ends up drafting him that retroactively end up finding this video, but just, just give me a second, okay? Me saying I see more Wentz than Allen in him doesn't mean I think he's a trash prospect, or else I wouldn't still have him in the first round, even if I do have him like in the late first round, lower than most. We've seen a Wentz-like player work in the NFL. I mean, he was an MVP candidate back in 2017. What made him that was his strong arm, his throw on the run accuracy, and his run you over determined attitude. All right, so a guy with their athletic profile and style of play can work. But the tendencies that caused the downfall of Carson Wentz's career to the place it's at now are the same tendencies that concern me if I were a GM in the NFL. The first is the most concerning to me because it's caused a lot of Wentz's inaccuracies over the past few years, especially his last year in Philly. Levis has the same poor footwork that causes them to sail passes right into the hands of defenders. As a general rule, from a young age, quarterbacks are taught to point their front foot towards where they're throwing the ball. 
if you want a more in-depth breakdown of this concept, Brett Coleman made a great video a couple years ago on Carson Wentz and this pigeon toe problem. Now, this may seem like a simple mechanical issue that's just a personal preference of the quarterback that's throwing the ball, but this has a major, major impact on the accuracy of the ball, especially outside the hashes towards the sidelines. The ball tends to travel on the path of where your front foot is pointed. Biomechanically, this is because if your front foot is pointed too far to the right, your hips aren't going to be able to rotate enough, and Levis would have to change his arm angle and put more power on the ball to get it where he needs it to go. This is the root cause of most of his interceptions and a lot of his ugly throws. It's also why his throws over the middle are so pretty, because he does tend to point the toe. He throws with great anticipation and throws to a spot rather than just to a receiver, which is an NFL trait that a lot of teams look for. The second tendency that concerns me is his biggest strength, the trait that's being so heavily praised right now, his toughness. Look, I, I like a QB that can stand in there and take a hit as much as anybody else, but I really don't want my franchise player taking hit after hit after hit that he doesn't need to. And Levis does all the time. Maybe he just doesn't see the defenders or doesn't feel them in the pocket until it's too late, but he'll do it when he scrambles. He'll try to run some D lineman or linebacker over. And that might work against Northern Illinois or some other not SEC level team, but not against Tennessee or Georgia. And it definitely won't work in the NFL. This is one of my main concerns with Trey Lance coming out of college. This play style of just, oh, I'm going to run you over because I've been bigger and stronger my entire life. So why wouldn't it work now? And that worked at North Dakota State when he's going up against a bunch of FCS talent. But that type of game doesn't translate well to the NFL because NFL players are also bigger and stronger. It's going to get you hurt. And obviously that concern was fully realized when Lance had that horrific leg injury when he was trying to run over a linebacker instead of sliding this past season. I won't show you the leg injury because I, I can't watch it. I hate watching leg injuries, so I, I'm not going to make you watch it. The last that reminds me a lot of Wentz is his hero ball tendency. A large part of this is just being a product of the situation he's in at Kentucky rather than like Alabama or Ohio State. But it can't be used as an excuse, rather it's the thing that instills this tendency in a lot of other QBs and it's very, very hard to coach it out. Unfortunate as it is, it's what kind of ruined Sam Darnold at USC too, after his entire offensive line graduated and he was left with an entirely new and inexperienced one for his last season. Levis constantly tries to extend plays when he shouldn't, constantly tries to stand in the pocket not feeling the pressure instead of throwing it away, and tries to fit it into almost non-existent windows to receivers that are blanketed. And he does it with almost a Tebow-esque belief that if I just throw it, it'll get there. And look, I'm not going to blame Levis for losing to Georgia and to Tennessee because those are just flat out better teams than what is around Levis right now. And his team does things like this. I mean, they loved leaving Jalen Hyatt open. They absolutely loved leaving him wide open. And an interception like this isn't his fault, but this one definitely is. Many just want to ignore these two games as inadmissible because Georgia and Tennessee are far better teams. But ignoring performances against top teams just because you're quarterbacking a traditionally basketball school is exactly what got Mitch Trubisky drafted second overall to the Bears above Patrick Mahomes. I'm not saying he should have been able to win those games, but if you're the top quarterback prospect in the country, in your two most important games of the season, you have to be able to lead your offense to more than six points. Against Tennessee, he couldn't even manage 100 yards and had three interceptions. The same Tennessee defense that three weeks later would give up 438 yards, six touchdowns, and 63 points to Oklahoma reject Spencer Rattler. Levis never had a game of more than 250 yards against a ranked opponent in his two years at Kentucky. After starting the season with three 300-yard performances against the powerhouses that are Miami of Ohio, Youngstown State, and Northern Illinois, Levis never had a game of more than 230 yards for the rest of the season. Four of those last seven ended up being less than 200. Even if you do want to just throw those Georgia and Tennessee games away, he only had 109 yards, zero TDs, and a pick against Vanderbilt, allowing them to get their first win in the SEC since 2018 after a 26-game losing streak. He throws a beautiful ball, but he has a lot of problems. And I would be more confident spending a pick on him as a developmental prospect if he was 21, like Stroud and Young are, like Mahomes and Allen were when they were drafted. But he's not. He's 23. 
and going to be 24 when the next NFL season starts. I'm not saying he doesn't have time, but to be in the conversation for best QB prospect at that age, you better be the most NFL ready. And he absolutely is not. Not when considering the things Bryce Young and CJ Stroud can do. If you want a developmental prospect with maybe a low floor, but a ceiling as high as anybody in this draft, if you coach him upright, go with the guy that runs a 44840 instead of a 472, is an inch taller, two years younger, and has an even larger wingspan. I'm still not confident his decision to declare this year rather than next year was smart, but Anthony Richardson is a developmental prospect I would go with over Levis if I had a pick in that mid first to late first round. I needed a quarterback and I already had my coaching situation figured out. And please, for the love of God, stop calling every out of nowhere prospect that's from a non-powerhouse school who's big, tough, has a huge arm and white, the next Josh Allen. I don't want to be having this conversation again next year with like Tyler Van Dyke or Grayson McCall or I don't know, Jackson Dart. Okay. But I know I will. I know it's going to happen. So see you next year, I guess.